I'm watching a TV show and they're like, okay, now it's a commercial. I'm like, no, 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 that's not a commercial. That's Carlos and Sugar. I'm sticking around for this as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hey, well, you'd probably appreciate this then. I found this. Uh, it's actually on my desk in my other room. Oh, nice. But this is like the legit, I think this is actually from before my time, but this is a gift I got to keep when I, when I left that place. Carlos, I'm so happy that you took the time to come across or come on this podcast. Uh, I know there's been times where it's like, oh, well, let's get Carlos on. It's like, well, he can't come on right now. He's a bit busy. I'm like, oh, man. And then, like, we finally got it settled. So I'm so thrilled that we actually got this settled. Yes, it is one of those things. It's it's a tricky thing, even though we're all more or less at home. Schedules yeah. still keep going. So it's difficult to get a lot of things um I don't know to keep things organized, but I'm glad we could do this too, man. This is great. It, it's it's fine because it's like like you said, timing is everything. Because there's actually a podcast I follow that's I I, I seen it across, come across on my Instagram, and uh, they interview maybe just like normal everyday people, but their whole concept is pretty much millennial stuff for like 90s to early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And they they came across one of my episodes, and they're like, "Oh, would you like to talk YTV?" I'm like, "It is so." interesting you said that because i'm gonna have carlos on and i'm like yeah that's a great plug for both episodes i'll come on and talk ytv and then you can also use carlos episode for ytv as well very cool very cool um but carlos take me back to the, the very beginning when you were a fetus tell me all about yes. when you were a fetus. <laughs> it, was, it was warm and wet mostly yeah uh, but tell me, like, so where did you grow up to? And I'm just really interested in how did you get into dance? Because I heard that you enrolled when you were like eight years old. Yes. So I, um, wow. So I was born in the Philippines. Um, I lived in Manila for, uh, you know, a little while there. And then we moved to Canada when I was very young, like three or four. So I lived in Vancouver and lived in Calgary. And by the time I was, I guess, in second grade, there was a dance school that opened up not too far from our house. And as the, as I recall, as I remember it, because it was a million years ago now, but my mom was like, oh, I'm going to sign up for dance classes. Does anybody want to come with me? And my brother said, no. And my sister said, no. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go. Like, I'll go with you. I didn't have anything else to do, really. I wasn't into anything other than, like, watching cartoons and playing video games. And then... Um, she heard that there was a recital that you had to perform on stage. So she backed out, but I stayed. And that was how I started. That was it. Oh, really? Okay. Th tell me a little bit more about just the, the move from the Philippines to Canada. Like, was there a particular reason that you had, like, that your family up and moved? Why, and like, why Canada? Well, my dad had, um, he had opportunities to work in either Canada or uh, in Australia. Actually, was the other was the other option because he had um, he had connections like friends and family in Australia, and um, I believe we chose Canada because my mom's parents moved here. Okay, and so we decided to stay with them for the first couple of years, and yeah, that was it. And it's been great. I don't know. I don't know any other you know any other lifestyle than the Canadian one that we've lived. So it's been uh, it's been a good time. That that's fair. I mean, yeah, I was always interested because like when you see acts that come from just a different part of the world or country, and then they choose Canada, and like I look at it from just even in the entertainment business. Now I, I know when you're young, it's almost like you're not going to your parents as like a, an eight year old, and be like, someday I'm gonna be on ET Canada. Why are we here? Like, why can't we go to like the United States where I can be on like ABC right. News? Um, but yeah. it's it's just fascinating to me because I look at Canada as almost like you either go with ED Canada, YTV, you're very limited compared to sometimes in the States where it's like a wide open spectrum. But I guess when you're young, you're just kind of like, we're going to move here. All right. I'll make the best of it. <laughs> yeah. I was three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's not much, just not much input as a three year old. <laughs> no, there really wasn't. <laughs> it didn't have anything to do with that. It yeah. was like three. Do I know where my toes are? Yep. Great. Yeah, yeah. We're in Canada. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it'd be funny. It'd be funny if you did. It'd be like, listen, we're all we're all on board going to Canada, but let's hear what Carlos has to say. And then Carlos yeah. is like, I'm sitting there smoking. A, my my chair turns around in my office. I'm smoking a cigar, and I'm like, listen, guys, I know about this Canada thing. Nah, yeah, yeah, dude, it was three. It was great. Yeah, I like though that. Um, of course, when you brought up about dance, and I I said off the hop, I don't want to tease you too much about dance because I'm in bowling, but like. 
when I read that or did a little bit of research, because I tell people this is like a Tinder date, but people show up. It's like, I don't know everything about you. I know right. the bare minimum enough to basically say, yeah, I'll go down that date with that person and then find out later. Sure. It's like, Whoa, it's a lot of information. <laughs> yeah. You didn't. Uh, yeah. No. Well, okay. Um, but, go on. No, no, no. I was going to say, but it's interesting because like as the bowling back background, I grew up with people that liked hockey. It's Canada, right? It's like hockey, soccer, basketball. And then you're like, I'm in bowling. Like, yeah. okay, why? So I love when you bowling, say, by the way. Yeah. I'm, when I'm you were, terrible at it, but like, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I, I love well, it. I was good. I was good at it, but no one cares. Like, it's almost like you go to school and you're like, I'm a really good bowler. They're like, all right, well, Shane over here has a hat trick in hockey. What'd you do? I'm like, well, I bowled a perfect game. They're like, okay. Did like, you bowl a perfect game? I, 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 when I was younger, I think I bowled one perfect game, at, at, if I can recall. Now that's that's an, yeah. that, but that is an actual accomplishment. Like that's amazing, because like I've never I've never spent more than like I don't know. Like we used to go to bowling alleys. There's a bowling alley in Burlington that we used to go to in high school, right? The longest amount of time I ever spent in one was when we did like the 24 hour challenge to raise funds for charity, okay. and I lost my mind because it was like so much bowling and I couldn't move my arms for a week after. But like, I don't think I've ever scored above like 185 or something. Like, I'm a terrible bowler. Okay, Steve. So you're 185 when I was like 16 or, or like 16 to 18 when I decided to quit bowling. That was probably what your average was. That was my average of like, hey, this is what you have to get to like you know be on par with the team. It's like when you when you go golfing and they're like, what's your score? Like that was pretty much my score. Is like I had to make 185 as my average, or if you went below it sucked if you're above it great but that's your bare minimum i was like oh, okay so <laughs> <laughs> so by that standard i mostly sucked yeah yeah but, yeah yeah and, and, and i don't mean past tense i still do yeah. like that would be yeah. how i would score tomorrow yeah. if i was playing a game yeah 100%. no it's like during during covid carlos was like you know what i have to get better at one thing right now and i'm gonna it's focus bowling. on my bowling <laughs> right yeah what you don't see behind the cameras i built myself a small bowling alley in this room with like yeah. a with a ramp that brings the ball back to me. It's all hydraulics and pulleys, yeah, yeah. pulley system. And uh, yeah, it's a bit noisy for the neighbors, but I got to get that score up, man. Yeah, you you you're, when you explain it to them, they'll understand. They're like, hey, I don't know what that noise is. And then you go over and like, listen, I'm a really bad bowler, just trying to improve my game. They're like, hey, at least he's trying. At least he's doing something. <laughs> yeah, everybody's everybody's like they've been working out or they've been learning how to cook. It's me. I built a bowling alley in my basement. I mean, great. That's that's something that I want to see on like ET Canada. If that was if that was real, it'd be like Carlos during COVID built a bowling alley in his basement. I'd be like, uh, get me on the phone with Carlos. I want to have a challenge right now. That'd be the greatest thing. I would love um, to have a bowling alley. Uh, Carlos, I want to ask you. Of course, I know you from YTV mostly. Now, I have I have come with you to ET Canada, so I'm not just one of those people that are like whatever Thank happened you. to Carlos. Mm -hmm. uh, but YTV was. And I try to keep it clean, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go across that line. It was the shit when I was hey. younger. Maybe. Like, yeah, right on. Loved it. I, you would, you would have to in a sketch comedy world, you'd have to get that hook, like you know, when someone tells a bad joke and they like take the, the the swing and get them off stage. That's what you'd have to do to get me off YTV watching it because it was like Pokemon. Uh, I mean, yeah. when later, like later, later it was like you know Drake and Josh and iCarly, but like, man, the cartoons that they used to show, it was like, Brian, you got homework to do. I'm like, I'm watching a TV show and they're like, okay, now it's a commercial. I'm like, no, 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 that's not a commercial. That's Carlos and Sugar. I'm sticking around <laughs> for this as well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hey, well, you probably appreciate this then. I found this. Uh, it's actually on my desk in my other room. Oh, nice. But this is like the legit, I think this is actually from before my time, but this is a gift I got to keep when I, when I left that place. Um, so I have a little bit of a little bit of it in my home right there. Awesome. Well, I mean, at least they let you keep some keepsakes right on the way out because I, I can imagine yeah, if you had to choose things, I would have I would have chosen like the YTV the zone sign or be like, man, I want to pick certain outfits that we had and keep them. But or I would have just been like, can I can I keep Carlos and Sugar? They're like, those are people. You can't <laughs> keep <are> people. people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. It's like I want yeah. I want those for my entertainment, and they'll be like, "No, they have other jobs." I'm like, "Come on, please." <laughs> <laughs> um, but how did you start with that? Because I I read once you graduated, you went like right into YTV. Now you've been a big entertainment late night fan. We both like Conan, 
I'm not a big oh, Letterman. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a big Letterman guy just because I think it's a little bit not my generation. But like, mm -hmm. I do like him. But Conan was my guy. Everyone yeah. has oh, like 100%. their go-to. Yes, uh, Conan was my guy for sure. Still, like, still is. Like, I still think he's the funniest, the funniest yeah. guy uh, doing that type of show. And not even that type of show anymore. He's still, he's evolving it, right? Like yeah. that's important too. Um, my brother got me into Letterman when I was a kid. So, you know, he used to he used to record Letterman on VHS because we couldn't stay up late, right? Yeah. So he would record it and then I we just kind of watch it. I didn't get easily three quarters of it, but uh, whatever. That's, that's kind of when I got hooked was when I was that young. But um, I don't know, before I started watch TV, I was, I was into a lot of stuff, right? I wanted to be a performer okay. uh, in some capacity. Like I had been dancing since I was a kid and I had been um a competitive dancer and had done it professionally in music videos and on uh in stage shows actually funny thing i was listening to your podcast with the ennis sisters oh wow okay and because i did a show with the ennis sisters one of my very first professional shows in downtown toronto and it was this um atlantic canada um culture show it was called the need fire and I was hired on to be like an Irish dancer. It was around the time that river dance was happening. Yeah. And like, I didn't, that's not a thing that I did, but I auditioned with my tap dancing. Like I was a tap dancer. And so the choreographer was like, I like, basically she was like, I like the cut of your jib essentially is what she said. She was like, you don't know what you're doing, but I like that you're doing it. So come I like on your board. moxie kid. <laughs> I like your moxie. Yeah, basically. And yeah, that's where I met the Anna sisters and a lot of actually, um, very cool East Coast Canadian musicians. So I just thought it was kind of cool. Because I saw your, when I was looking you up, when I was doing our my Tinder date research, oh, I saw okay. that, you had, uh, that you had interviewed them. So I had to, of course, um, take a listen because they're really great. Yeah, I mean, that was one of our first episodes. So it's kind of, it's like, you know, when you're, anything when you're first starting off, it's like, it's kind of choppy. It's kind of like, you're like, oh man, like I'm trying to get the editing down. So it's not like the, not not anything against them. It's just in my terms, it wasn't the best editing that I've ever done. But it's almost like, what are you gonna do? You gotta you gotta put it out there. But um, it's interesting that you said that. But like, explain to me how you ended up going to YTV. Like, do they make you audition? Did you have to like send in a resume at this point, or did you just walk in through the door and was like, hey, I'm interested? It's like, how did you know that they were kind of hiring? Well, I was in theater school, so I was a. Uh... I was in theater school in Toronto at the Randolph Academy. It's called the Randolph College for the Arts now. I think it's the Randolph Academy for the Performing Arts. And they, YTV, had been just auditioning at the schools. I think they were looking for people at comedy clubs and looking for people at um, at theater schools. I think typically the idea was that they would hire someone who was, you know, that had a comedic background that was like a stand up comic or an improv comic or whatever it was. Yeah. So there's me. I was like this musical theater kid and a dancer. But it just so happened the timing was right because everything that they had done in the audition that we had been asked to do in the audition was kind of stuff that we were working on in school, just the instincts of that sort of improv stuff. And so I auditioned once and got a call back and then I auditioned again and a, that callback audition was with Shug. Um, and then I had a meeting with the executive producer and she was like, you, you know, essentially she's like, you start Monday kind of thing. So I was oh, like, wow. amazing. And so I had, I was in my last year at school when I was auditioning. We, you could only audition in your last term at that school at that time. Okay. And um, I was in the middle of doing our, basically like learning our final performance musical that we were doing and did the auditions, got the call back, whatever. And then I started the day after grad. So oh, we right. had grad on like the Sunday or whatever, the weekend after, after that weekend, the grad on the Sunday and I started work on the Monday. So I was fortunate that way, but yeah, it wasn't like, I didn't know they were looking, you know, it wasn't that sort of thing where I was, I was necessarily looking yeah. actively to be part of it. They were auditioning and I was like, oh, I love YTV. Cause I was like you, except when I, I'm older than you. So <laughs> well, I was watching, you know, I was watching TJ Phil and all that stuff when I was a kid and I was like, oh, YTV would be amazing. And yeah. also on top of that, like you want to be a performer and it's a job. You're like, someone wants to hire me for a job. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I'm doing it. And it was, you know, it turned into almost 20 years of like just the best job ever. Yeah, it, it's crazy because I looked at like, again, doing a bit of research. I think it was like 16 years or so that you, you were there. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, I was like double checking that. I'm like, is that true? Like 16 years at like YTV. That's insane. But 
I, like, is, I'm yeah. sure there, I'm sure there are people that like that are older than me, that are younger than me, that go back to that time frame that they'll remember you with a certain co-host. Like I, like I said, I remember you with Sugar just because I was very surprised. Like when you have like the Kachung moment, or like you, someone tells you like a certain fact and you can't believe it. Like I, I remember Sugar's voice is very distinctive, but I was mm-hmm. surprised and blown away when I found out like oh she was also a voice of Sailor Moon. And it still, to me, shocks me when someone brings it up. I'm like, I know this, but it's still surprising to me. And then when you go back and on YouTube, you find old clips of you and Sugar doing uh, like segments in between shows. I'm like, they're very natural at it. But now I can see, like as a kid, you're just like, oh, these guys are great. Like they must have just came up out of nowhere and just very talented. But you explain the performing arts background. It, it, it When you get older, you're like, oh, okay, so it's right up his alley. Of course, this is what, you know, it would be successful rather than someone like myself or a professional bowler coming in and being like, yeah, I'll, I'll go on YTV. And then they were like, can you, can you talk in front of that camera? Oh no, I, I can't do that. It's like, well, why are you here for? <laughs> <laughs> like, what did you think this was? Um, right, right, but yeah, right. No, I think that's an interesting story, but why were some of your, I guess, to kind of dive into it. Cause I know you, ex- you showed the YTV, I guess it was like the big basketball, which I thought was yeah. awesome. Um, what were some of your favorite, I guess, moments of YTV or favorable moments? Like when you look back, you're like, man, I can't believe I got to do this for this long. Yeah, well, that's one right there. Like, <laughs> I can't believe I got to do this for this long. Like, I, um, when I first started out, I basically asked questions like, well, how long did Pat do it for? Like, Pat was the guy before me. I was yeah. like, how long does it, I mean, how long do people do this for? And I know Phil had done it for a very long time. And I was like, oh, Pat maybe did it for three years. Okay, I'll do it for three. If I can, if they can keep me for three years, like that'll be great. And I'll c- figure out something else. But it just kept being awesome. Like it, it, it kept, it was like very hard to um, almost imagine doing something else because I also had an opportunity to do other things while I was still doing it. So it was a steady gig I got to do all the time. Plus I still got to be a dancer. So I was still a professional dancer. I was part of a tap dance company and I was dancing in movies and stuff. Um, so that was one of the things, just really just being able to do it for so long. Um, but yeah, every sort of era, for lack of a better term, has comes with its own amazing set of memories. Like Shug and I, like we're the OG duo, like we're the original team. And so that's that's always got like a real soft spot in my heart uh, for that era, of course. And we just came up with so many fun concepts and did so many dumb things. And we're learning a lot together, like learning yeah. how to do this together. She had some experience before I did it, but you know, we were a great team in the sense that I think on camera we were good, but also in prep, in writing stuff, we clicked. And so it, it worked really well. Um, so that was always really fun. Later on, it became, obviously uh, there were tons of other great people that came through too, that we felt similar as well. Um, yeah. But the thing that we were doing most recently that I think was one of the most rewarding and I felt so fortunate to be able to do was travel across Canada with the show. Ever since I started, we had been talking about this idea of like, what if we did a a cross Canada road trip? What if we did a cross Canada road trip? Um, And we couldn't quite figure out how to make it happen. And then, you know, several years down the line, the team figured out how to make it happen. There was an appetite for it. So we ended up doing this, um, it had different names every summer, but it was essentially the zone summer road trip. And we would go, to different spots in BC, over on the East Coast, a lot of Ontario, um, Alberta, basically touch almost every province and just find all the fun things there, talk to very cool people there that are doing interesting things, uh, learn some cool things about being in that city, that town or that province, and just kind of get an opportunity to see also what, I don't say, I don't say like our impact, but get an opportunity, an opportunity yeah, like, to, I guess to see what it, the fans- it. Yeah. Get a feel of like what they're taking out from the show, like what Absolutely. things like their yeah. aspects. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, when you're in Toronto all the time, you do yeah. get an opportunity to see a lot of fans, and there's there's a certain little, you know, there's a, a world that you're living in, there's a bubble that you're living in. Um, so to be able to reach out beyond that and get face to face with people and see what their take is on the stuff that we're doing was actually very very cool. It's yeah, like I, I like how you mentioned that period. Of course, like you know, one of those achievements is 16 years of doing it, and when you said earlier, like timing is everything, you know, sometimes it's the right place, right time. Like I, I'm not taking anything away from just to say this generation, because of course you can go on YouTube. Now there's influencers, there's like 
TikTokers. I'm not a big fan of all that, but it's just, I thought growing up in the 90s to early 2000s was just great. Just not even just in general, but like just for Canada itself, because you have YTV. You'd go mm. onto the family channel. The family channel had like there just say two or three people that you'd see every so often if it's not being plugged by like, you know, this program is brought to you by blah, blah, blah. But much music was a big thing. Like when you're talking about fans and interacting with fans, like I don't think I would have loved to go see like be in Toronto. Now I'm about 29. So I would have been really young at this point, but you'd have like MMA VA or like much music video awards. Yeah, and I, was, yeah. I just see people banging on the glass for much on demand. And I was just still like, I'd love to go back now and be a part of that. But like, that has to be crazy when you go by and in a building like YTV or even ET Canada, and you still see maybe people outside being like, I know they're in there. It's like, I, I know they're doing something live. Like, let me just wave or let me just be yeah. a part of that. But like, cause I feel like, especially in COVID now when you're watching sports and there's no fans, I can imagine when you're doing just say a much music or a YTV and you don't get that fan interaction, it kind of feels like, well, what are you really doing it for? Cause the fans kind of amp you up. Mm. Right. Mm. Well, I mean, I know the team, right. That, that are doing it now and they're doing a phenomenal job like holding down the fort and keeping all that spirit alive um yeah. but it was i mean to your point the 90s and early 2000s was a really exciting time to be a fan of you know kind of local ish television i guess yeah. you could say like kind of canadian television and also to be working in the industry it was a super exciting time it's still exciting now for many different yeah. reasons but your particular point about that fan interaction um, because that was the only way you could interact, right? Exactly. Yeah. That was an exciting thing to be a part of. Yeah, and I was I was a fan too of all that of the MMBAs, of much of Speakers Corner. Like, um, that was sort of the template for a lot of what everybody else did, right? Like they, yeah. they charted a course for a lot of other people in uh, in broadcasting. Yeah, it's kind of crazy when you think back of it, because like you don't. It's like one of those things where you take it for granted at the time, but like. I remember coming home from school on like a Monday because I, again, I didn't stay up late to watch the video, much music video awards or anything of that nature, but you'd, you'd see them replay it, say at three o'clock or four 30 Newfoundland time. And you're just thinking like, okay, great. It's a, it's a much music video awards. They got Eminem, Britney Spears, whatever. And you're like, all right, not a big deal. But then you forget that they're literally in Toronto. They're literally performing outside on a stage where there's fans surrounding the whole area that are like, could live a block away, could have came from Burlington, Ottawa, just to see this mm -hmm. spectacle. And like, I was just, you don't take it in as a child, but when you get older, you're like, man, I wish I was a little bit older so I could have taken in that experience. But I mean, you were, you had to be in this area. Did you ever go to like a Much Music Video Awards? Were you ever in one of those like outside Much Music when say a, an act that you liked came and were like bang on the glass, like, oh my God. <laughs> Whenever anything was popping on the Queen Street, we'd be there. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime something was happening there, we'd we'd be there. It would either <clears throat> whether we were there at the event or at, at an event after the event or taking yeah. part. It was just fun to, to take advantage of what was actually happening. You know what I mean? Like fun to be part of it. Just yeah. To, well, I was so young when I started. I was I think twenty when I started, okay. something like that. Um so that was prime time for me to want to be involved in in all those things and just be involved in what's exciting about being in the city for sure um now of course like like i mentioned it's been 16 years and i've read from doing a bit of research on ytv it's like like anything so it's not just pinpointing on ytv but you know there comes a point whether the company says it or you decide it that you get to to leave and when i was doing a bit of research with ytv it was like there were some people that were have been there since maybe 93. And then mm -hmm. when they started doing like this whole shift, like just say it went from YTV zone to another name, they were like, yeah, you don't fit the the blend of what we want the zone to be. It's like, did you ever have to come across that path? Like now, not with management, but yourself from being there 16 years. Cause again, if you start when you're 20 and just say you leave at, I don't know, it takes 35, 36, whenever you left, you grow obviously in that, in that field. And were there points that you're kind of thinking like, do I really want to do this anymore? Or like, is it time to go? Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. There would be, there would be moments 
like I said in the beginning, I was like, well, I think I'll be here for about three years. But yeah. that was the that was the thing I thought I was gonna do. And so not long after that, it was there's always a part of your brain that goes, okay, well, what's the next thing? Like where's yeah. where's another opportunity? Where can I show um, my abilities? What can I be a part of? What's exciting? Um, so I had the opportunity to do both things kind of concurrently for a while, for a while, almost the entire time I was there. If I wanted to do another project, I could. Yeah. Um, but I kept coming back to like, to the fact that I just really enjoyed what I was doing. As, as corny as it sounds, and maybe it sounds corny to people, I don't, I don't know. But I would get comments from people quite a bit that would be one of two sides. It would be, you've been there forever. What are you going to do next? Yeah. And then the other one would be, you've been there since I was a kid. I don't ever want you to leave. <laughs> right? And so it's nice to be able to take in both sides because you have to be critical, I think, of, of what you're doing. Understand yeah. where your limitations are and maybe what you um what your path is try to find what your path is but my path just kind of stayed there and it was yeah. dope <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like we did we did so much fun stuff man like i don't know what else to tell you we were yeah. you know um every time i thought ah oh, i don't know how much more i can do someone was like hey what about this stupid fun idea I was like, yeah, I want to do that stupid fun idea. Let's do the stupid fun idea and let's keep yeah. doing it. And yeah. so it's, it's, I never thought about for myself, like the idea of having to bend and twist to stay current so that I could stay with YTV. Like it was never that thought. Yeah. I just kind of looked at it as I'm just going to dive into whatever we're doing. I'm going to keep, they want me to be myself. Like that's the whole purpose of this thing. We also yeah. want kids to be themselves. So if I'm not being myself, I'm not being a genuine person, I'm not living the example that we want to, to show. Yeah. Um, and I was just fortunate to be able to be this kind of nerdy goof <laughs> for as long as I got to do it and have someone, you know, want to put me on TV for it, which is pretty great. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I like your answer, but what I was kind of going into, and I'm not criticizing the answer, it's just kind of bringing it where I was generally hoping to go is when when i look at say someone like a rick campanelli or a george trompolopoulos who's on much music and you see them kind of evolve to the point where it's like when rick first started being called rick the temp and like you could see him on like summer break wearing a backwards hat or like funky shorts but then like it's like okay that's cool for a 20 year old but like when you're 40 and it's like okay now you have a kid or like that's i'm not i'm not saying you can't but it's like almost like ah do you really want to be acting 20 like there's nothing wrong with being 40 and acting 40. And I looked at like George Drombolopoulos when like the first time I seen him on, I think it was like much music and there's all the piercings and you know, the rock shirts. And as a kid, you're like, Oh my God, like that's heavy metal. I'm scared. Um, and then watching him on the hour and like just seeing the, the change, I was like, okay, so they're growing, they're evolving. They're more or less saying like, I could still do this, but I'm just taking my realm to another platform. And that's what I kind of felt like with you where it was like, I've done what I had to do at YTV. Like I reached out to kids. Now you guys are probably growing up with me. So I'm going to go to ET Canada where yes, I'm still going to do interviews. I'm still going to be the same Carlos, but it's almost like on a, a, maybe an adult platform compared to like a kid's platform. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're, okay. So, so the idea of evolution is this, is this what we're Yeah. Yeah. About? Like, basically, like, yeah, basically. Cause like when I look at it and seeing all these people like evolve, like, when you're looking at him from much music's point of view or YTV, and it's almost like it's like a graduate program in a way, where it's almost like once they were at much music, they've done what they could at much, they've done what they could at YTV. It's almost like, okay, we've got our core audience that were with us since we were small. So now we're going to adapt and go to ET Canada or wherever they go. And it's like, mm -hmm. this is more for an adult audience. Like, I don't imagine a five year old watching ET Canada. I could be wrong, but it's almost like, hey, I'm going to stick with Carlos right where he goes. If he's going to ET Canada, I'm going to go because I've grown up with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like as he evolves, I evolve. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I think about um, your, your shows target age demo and how that, how that relates to how you are on camera. Yeah. Um, I can't speak to any of the guys that you mentioned before, cause I'm also a fan of those guys and I, I love yeah. watching them evolve and move on into the next things as well. Um, 
but I don't think that at YTV I was, we were speaking to an age demo that was trying to be of the moment okay or or particularly cool or represent like I, I think i was fortunate in that way because if i was if i had been speaking specifically to an audience that was let's say 13 to 16 yeah or 15 and older or whatever it is the way trends and things move and shift so quickly you can very quickly not be in the middle of it yeah. right like you could just if you if you're trying to be the cool guy forever there's a point in time where you turn back and you realize you haven't been the cool guy for like 20 years. I, we weren't trying to be a cool thing. Like there was no, ever, there was never like a, we're trying to be a cool. Yeah. Um, I know the cool kids on the block doing this thing that's happening right now. We were talking to our audience and just, we're like, whatever's clever, we're just doing it. Whatever's yeah. fun and stupid, we're just doing it. And um, I mean, luckily for me, I could just be fun and stupid for a very long time. I could probably be 65 and still be fun and stupid, <laughs> you know, and that may not look exactly the same way. Um, that's not to say- flags, Be that six flags guy in those commercials. <laughs> right, yeah. He looks like, oh my God, maybe it is me. Maybe we discover time travel and yeah. that's me from the future. And I went back in time to do six flags ads. Yeah. What, a, yeah. Yeah, what a great get, what a, what a good gig for me in the future. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm not trying to, to be contrary to anything that you're saying. I just think that with regards to what we were doing, I know for the hosts, um, for a lot of them, it was like, this is my choice. Now I want to go do something different. Yeah. I've, I felt like I've fulfilled what I need to fulfill in this and I want to go do something different. Yeah. Um, I didn't get to a point where I thought this is the upper limit of everything I ever want to do with YTV and I'm completely done with it. Like I didn't <laughs> have that thought. Even, even on the day that I was going, I was working, YTV and ET Canada at the same time because I yeah. had been um, I've been approached to join the team at ET Canada and I, th I felt very fortunate for that and I thought what a great next step to your point again like evolution what a great yeah. next step for me to be able to do I've I've owned a bunch of skills here at YTV that I think are applicable to what I could do at ET Canada it gives me an opportunity to stretch a little bit and and tackle some new um, some different content yeah. and. Uh, and I still get to be part of a really cool team and family at YTV. And so I had to do both for a while and eventually it was like, all right, now I'm not gonna do the YTV thing anymore. I'm gonna go and completely board this ship over here yeah, yeah. and and have fun and be less, maybe appear less dumb, but still yeah. have fun um, with this show and be able to take with me a lot of the skills I learned over like uh, like the 16 years at the last one. Yeah. No, I like your answer. And I, I kind of find it interesting because, again, it's like a similar path. Because when we had Rick Campanelli on in an early episode, he said the same thing. Like he was doing much music and then he went to ET Canada. And it, my favorite story with kind of on this was I was actually interning at Global for I think it was like a, a month or two month period. Now, I only I didn't stay too long, but uh, I ran into Rick Campanelli and I didn't know if it was really Rick. Like it was almost like those moments where you're like, I don't think that's really him. And I felt like going up to him, but I like everyone's busy. I get it. But as a kid, you didn't. But when you're older, you're like, okay, they got makeup to do. They got to get ready. And I think I just like waved at him and he didn't either see me. And then when I had him on the podcast, I told him like, I waved at you and you didn't, you didn't even wave back to me. Like what kind of ass does that? And he's like, man, what are, what are you talking about? I didn't even see you. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right, fair enough. But I love how he, he explained in his answer that he was still doing much music interviews and he was doing ET Canada interviews, but he just said there, was, there just came a point of time at much where he's like, let the next crowd come in. Like, let's let the next generation get a chance here. Like I'm moving on. I've done what I've done. So I'm going here. Um, but like, it's not really, I guess, a big transition because you're still doing interviews with like movie stars, musicians. It's just almost like a different, I guess, channel or platform really. Um, so what kind of came across your mind to finally say, I'm done with YTV, I'm going to ET Canada. I know you kind of went into it, but where was the breaking point where you're like, ET Canada strictly now? I'm honestly trying to recall. Yeah. Like maybe, maybe it was one day where you're just still like, you know what? I don't want to get, I don't want to, I don't want to get gushed with green goo anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Like, I don't, you don't want me to lie down on the skateboard with a helmet yeah. on and, and try to get a... <laughs> Try to get a beach ball into a bed. No, um, I I don't know. I honestly think it was just it was just such a smooth transition. It really was yeah. just like 
Um, I'm going to do less and less of this now at YTV. The goal was always when I first joined ET Canada was I would be with them full yeah. time. And it was just like one year of doing both. And then when that time is up, the time is up. And that was yeah. the end of it. And so, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a thing that I often say when, when big changes and transition happened. And I'm, I say like, how did you expect this to end? What did you yeah. picture in your head for the way this was going to finish? And I use that kind of as a way to, to make real life transitions, real difficult endings, um, yeah. maybe not as difficult, just to put those things into perspective. And, um, and I had a picture in my head of what my last show would be like and what my last day would be like. And I thought, that's the only way I can do my last show. That's the only way. And it's it's going to be a mirror of the first day. It'll be a mirror yeah. of the day that I started. Um, but then when life kicked in and I got to my last day, I loved my last day. I was bawling like a baby afterwards. It, didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything like um, I had pictured it was going to be, but it was just like, it, it, I don't know. It just It just felt sad and bittersweet and great and... Yeah, all those things. So I don't know if that answered any of your questions at all. No, that's no, just it, me telling I mean, the telling it, the sappy it, story. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's fair because I kind of like how you went into like the sappy story because in a in a way I, I want to, of course, go in different directions here, but hopefully it's the last kind of question regarding this. But like, I look at it from the standpoint of I graduated from, I graduated from Carleton University with communications. I love that university. Like mm -hmm. even when I go back to Ottawa, I like to go back on the campus. And the first few years when you graduate, you're like, oh, great. Like I'm an alumni. This is cool. But then like when you get to like the fifth or sixth year after you graduate and then you see new faces come in, you're like, I don't know if I really belong here anymore. It's like almost like I, I feel like I'm a little bit too old for this. But and I'm not saying anything like you're too old for anything. Um, That's just how I felt at the time. But mm. it's interesting because, you know, you, you've you've been in this place for so long with the YTV and then you see people leave, like when Sugar leaves in 2007, of course, that's a like a close friend, someone that you've mm -hmm. got great chemistry with, someone else comes in, and then they leave. And like, you feel like you're like the lone survivor or like the last person left. So there's like, to me, it's almost like, great, I'm like the longest lasting person here. There's like a bit of a stroke to it, like a, a great accomplishment. And then there's also another part of you, like, I guess it's the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Self-critical, I guess, where it's like, well, why are you staying here? Like, why don't you move on to <laughs> like, do you ever have those moments when you see other people come and go where you're kind of like, I get it. Like from your answer, it sounds like you love doing it and it's, it's, you just love doing it, whatever. But have you had those kind of sit down moments where you're like, okay, so I've been here this long. I've seen these people come and go. Like what's next for me? Yeah, no, of course I did. Yeah. I sat there for sure. But it was, it, I don't know. I think I just see it differently. Yeah. Or there was a period of time when um, I might have had those thoughts that were a bit more critical, but they didn't stick around for very long. Yeah. We were just... Well, good for you, Carlos. Mine stay with me forever. I go to bed <laughs> and still... <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, it just... Um, we're just so focused on what we were doing. I keep saying we because it was the team of us, right? Like, yeah. I was a host there, but the... I was just one part of everything that we did. And, yeah. you know, whether it was myself and Shug or myself and uh, uh, Suki or anyone else that I was working with at the time, we're two parts of a big team of people that are always coming yeah. and going. Not everybody gets to stick around, even producers or writers, for a very long time. Um, but I don't know, man. I just kind of stayed focused in on what we were doing. <laughs> it's, it's just... just <laughs> And it was like, what's because the other thing was, we're doing it every single day. It's like, here's yeah. a show that we got to do every single day um, and put together some goofy stuff and then also plan for the next two weeks in advance and plan for the next month in advance and, and try to brainstorm some bigger picture things like live concert shows and all the stuff that we ended up doing. So all that to say, like, it was, if you were only watching from a certain period of time, because you're yeah. only, you know, six, seven, eight, nine for those years of your life, right? Yeah. You're only watching for that period of time. You go, wow, I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm watching right now. You leave, it's out of your headspace. You grow up a little bit. You turn back and you go, whoa, that thing is still going on with that same dude. What's going on there? Yeah. But the people that are six, seven, eight, nine that are watching are like, 
I'm liking what I'm watching right now. This is some creepy yeah. stuff. And then the people that are making it, like we were going, okay, this is what we're doing every every day in this stage. Then it moved on to the next sort of era, like I was talking about. And the show shifts a little bit. Our focus shifts a little bit, the way we do things changes, there are new challenges. And then we decide we want to try and do different things. So we did concert shows, we did live interview shows, we did all these different things that we had um, that weren't all the same thing. So I think that's maybe part of it that helps with the answer to this is that though it was like, here's the same gig I'm doing all the time. There are new challenges all the time to overcome within this particular gig and new responsibilities and new things to yeah. learn. So outwardly facing, yeah, it's it's 16 years of being on that show. You put write that down on paper. But the show was not the same show when I left. For 16 years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, it's fair. I, I just thought it was interesting because, like, again, growing up and then, like you said, you, you turn it off for a bit and you grow up and then, like, you come back. And I have a niece and nephew that will turn on YTV. And it's, like, different – again, different shows are on, of course. And then there's, like, different hosts. And I was like, okay, like, they're still kind of doing – like the same thing. And I was like, I, I like it from one side of things. Cause it's like, okay, that's their generation's Carlos and sugar. That's their generation's, you know, moments of this TV show. Um, but at the same time, it's like, if I want to relive kind of my childhood, it's like, all right, well I can watch Carlos on the ET Canada. It's like, I can watch him do interviews there and uh, you know, he'll live in the present as much. Right. Um, but with ET Canada, like how have you found, I guess that transition and, I know you've been there now for a while, but like, mm -hmm. how have you found that? Um, like, what were some of, I guess, your favorite moments or memories with ET Canada? It sounds like I'm like basically going like, Carlos is saying goodbye to ET Canada, but like, he's not. But like some of your favorite moments- Do you know moments, something like, I don't? Do you know something I don't? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I like, you know, I got the PR release. Didn't they send take it to this, you? Didn't they send it down. to you? No, no, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, what are some of your favorite memories, I guess? And um, like some favorite interviews? Cause I can, I can tell you, with some interviews, it's really awkward, right? Like when you meet your idol or someone that you wanted to interview and you're like, okay, how do I, how do I handle this? I can't be a total fan, but have you had those moments? Man, I get into like work mode. So the, the people that would make me have that weird being like a, like do it like a fangirl moment kind of thing, yeah. so to speak. Um, I've met them. This is Jackie Chan, and that, this is way back in YTV. I interviewed him for the first time, so I got that out of my system when I interviewed him yeah. when I was on YTV. Um, and it's one of those things where you've only got four minutes with someone, but you want to talk about their entire oh, yeah. like catalog of work in the four <laughs> minutes that they're supposed to be talking about the Karate Kid, you know. Um, but it doesn't happen to me often where I get kind of, you know, sidelined away. And that's not the right word, but kind of taken aback by the by the person that I'm interviewing at this starstruck. point. Yeah. Yeah, starstruck. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but at this point, with all the interviews that we do, the volume of them, I'm doing three a day, perhaps even even now in uh during COVID. It just becomes a it's the process of like who am I gonna be interviewing? What story do we want to get? What are the questions that we want to ask? Um Let's let's have a good interview, and then let's put a good story together. And it's not until after the fact, often, that I'll go, "Oh yeah, hey, I interviewed that person." Like I'll yeah, be yeah. watching a movie, and I'll go, "Have I ever?" Like someone will ask, "Hey, have you ever interviewed so and so?" I'm like, "I yeah. don't know." Yeah, I, yeah. I'm not entirely sure because there are just so many of them. That's not to say that things aren't memorable for sure. Yeah. Um, when I first started, I think one of the coolest things was just being on the set. And like getting to do a show with Cheryl and with Sangita and with Roz, like that was awesome because I hadn't, I think until the time that I had been sort of presented with the idea that I could be working for ET Canada, it hadn't really crossed my mind that, that I'm going to go work with these people. So it was cool to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, one of the weirdest kind of like, I don't know, weird, but you know, you said you're not five years old and watching Entertainment Tonight Canada, but I was five years old. And I was watching Entertainment Tonight. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You you, you were know? just you were a big fan of late night TV. I I know that. <laughs> right, but but like I I remember being a kid and watching like John Tesh and Mary Hart when I was a kid because you would just sit like there's no YouTube. You don't get a chance to watch what you want on your own. Yeah. Like we only had one TV in the house, so we just watched whatever my parents wanted to watch. And so if they were watching that show, that's what I was watching. And so I had a chance to interview. Uh, John Tesh actually a couple of years ago, which was like, 
it's not really like a, a starstruck moment, but it felt like a really cool kind of like full circle thing. I'm like, yeah. I totally remember watching this show. And it didn't, it didn't strike me when I was a kid. I was like, this is my future. It wasn't anything like that. I was like, oh, I, I remember watching this show. And when I got to interview him and he was very complimentary after the interview, I was like, this is wild. Like what a cool, what a cool experience to be able to have. Yeah. It, it's funny because like I look at it from the standpoint of when you're saying like a cool experience to have and you don't think you're ever going to like, you, you didn't think of it at the time. Like no one's sitting at home. Maybe I was, but no one else is sitting at home at like five or six going like, I'm interviewing this person one day. Like my, I know on your bucket list, I think you said James Corden is one person that you would love to interview. Um, like I would like to interview Conan O'Brien for mine. That was like my, oh, sure. kind of bu my bucket list of people. But it's interesting because like every interview, like yourself included, when you get to interview people that you grew up watching or you listen to their music, you go back later and you're like, I can't believe I got to interview that person. Like for me, the first ever interview that I got to do was like Jimmy Rankin. And the funny thing is I was late to the interview. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> great way to start off your first podcast episode. Be late to your own interview. And uh, I was, I was, remember when we were younger, uh, my brother had to go to BC to move. So from Newfoundland to BC, and we went in a small car. And as soon as we got across Newfoundland to Nova Scotia, the first two songs I remember coming off on the ferry was like Tim McGraw and Jimmy Rankin. And I was like, oh, pure East Coast. Of course, you're going to play Jimmy Rankin when you get in Nova Scotia as a radio station. But I remember telling him that. And I just remember that memory and I was like, imagine if you had to tell me at like 12 or like 13, whatever, how old I was, you know, in like 10 years, you're going to interview Jimmy Rankin and you're going to tell, talk about this on that episode. I would have been like, yeah, whatever, buddy. But yeah, like bringing it full circle, like what you said, yeah. it's like you get that whole moment of like, I remember watching this person when I was growing up and now I get to interview them. Um, it's kind of like a gung ho starstruck moment, but at the same point, you're like, all right, like they're a person, like I'm a person, like, let's just have yeah, an interview. Sure. Well, yeah. It, it all, I think it comes down a lot to what you enjoyed when you were growing up. When you were most impressionable, you know, what was what was that thing that really spoke to you? So when you were a teenager, yeah. who were you a big fan of? When you were a kid, like, who were you a big fan of? And so when you get a chance to talk to that person or meet that person, that's when you're kind of it. I mean, you just mentioned Conan O'Brien. I hadn't even thought about the idea of yeah. interviewing Conan O'Brien. You just mentioned it, and I was like, oh, yeah, maybe that would be the one. Like, maybe that would be one where I'd be like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to say here. <laughs> if, like, if, if you interview Conan O'Brien and I get to watch it, I'll be like, I'll be like that mother Carlos gets to interview. <laughs> that's right. And you know we'll, where we'll do the interview? A bowling alley. And I'll, oh, I'll, you, oh, I'll you score so a much. perfect game against Conan <laughs> yeah. O'Brien. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and but I'll have when to I... watch it on TV, and you, that's just rubbing <laughs> in my face. No, <laughs> no, I got, I did get a chance to interview some, some, uh, some heroes like that. But it was, you know, when I was growing up, I was so into, you know, Jackie Chan like action movies, right, and comic books and all those sorts of like kind of nerdy stuff. So for me, the biggest sort of Star Trek moments were those people that I don't know that a lot of, um, a lot of people that maybe are just fans of movies might be starstruck by like when I, I interviewed Frank Miller a long time ago and Frank yeah. Miller, of course, Dark Knight. Right. And that to me was massive. That was crazy to me that I got to interview Frank Miller. And again, I was young at the time. I was like 23 or something like that. <laughs> um, but that was a wild one for me. And, uh, <laughs> and we grew up listening to Weird Al Yankovic. I got to interview Weird Al Yankovic and I was like, this is crazy. Like that sort of thing. But it's, it's, weird like i'm a weird person so my influences are all really weird and yeah. when i got to interview weird people i that's that's when i was like wow this my life is crazy right now yeah do you remember i guess because of course doing so many interviews you get better in time i'm still learning clearly i've, I've done a hundred odd episodes i'm still learning uh Always it's like learning. Do, yeah yeah but do you remember mm -hmm. like i guess your most awkward one like because i look at sometimes you'll listen to an interview after you've done it or once it's done you're like oh man that interview didn't go well and then afterwards you're like okay it wasn't as bad as what i thought but have you ever had like i guess an awkward memorable interview where you're kind of like oh man like what happened here like what did i do yeah i you know <laughs> those interviews where you go oh man like i could have done better those actually happen all the time at least for me yeah, yeah like, and they might they might come out on TV or, or on our extended interviews on YouTube, and they might look like a really good interview, but in the moment, I might not have gotten what I was wanting to get out of it, or I might have said something I thought felt a little bit awkward. I had a moment in the beginning of uh, COVID, there was a movie, what was, which was it, which was it? It was an animated movie, and Maya Rudolph was in it, and um, and so was, uh, oh man, did you ever watch Last Man on Earth? 
Uh, like I, I've heard of it. I, I'm not a big movie goer to be honest, but like okay. I, I, okay. I, I see the trailers and then I'm like, okay, this looks okay. <laughs> okay. No, the people in the comments are going to be like, yeah, that guy, cause I can't remember his name right now, yeah, yeah. Um, but he's amazing and he's hilarious. And so I was interviewing them for this movie and zoom was already awkward, right? Like it was, it was like, we just didn't know exactly how to do this thing at the time. And when we signed off and was like, anyways, guys, I, I really enjoyed the movie. I thought it was great. My kids are going to love it. Um, uh, great talking to you. Bye. Love you guys. Bye. And then I went, I just told them I love them. I said, I, I said, I love you guys. Like I was talking to my family. Like I was talking to my family over a FaceTime. Okay. Love you. I'll see you later. Bye. <laughs> and I know they heard it because their faces both went. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I said it, I was like, oh, geez, I gotta figure this thing out. Um, so, I mean, that was one recently. So, yeah. you know, you were talking about the experience of doing however many interviews and things getting easier, the awkward moments happen like oh, yeah. still all the time. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to be fair, to fair, to share one of mine, like I, I have many, but I like, like I'm from Newfoundland. I like comedy. So like, you know, some people, we live in a world now of social media where people want to post their highs. They're afraid to share their lows because yes, there's a lot of like internet hate or people will come after you. I'm like the polar opposite where I'm like, I will gladly share my low if someone sees it and they're like, I didn't have as bad as day as Brian. And I'm like, great. I hope you feel better. Um, <laughs> I've had like interviews where the mic, like this mic has dropped in mid conversation and then you're like picking it up on the floor and then like trying to hold it while talking. And then I'm just still, like trying to keep cool at the same point where it's like, not like I got to cancel this interview. It's going bad. It's like, okay, like just hold the interview here or like hold the mic and keep continuing. <laughs> I've had one with like Bob Saget where I told him that there was an alternate ending to How I Met Your Mother. And he's like, there's no alternate ending. There's one with Josh Randor that gives you an ending and I give you an ending. I'm like, and I, I debated with him. I was just like, you don't remember the ending where, you know, he actually, the, the his wife doesn't die. He goes out with like, they end up happily ever after, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, that wasn't a thing. And I'm just like, did I dream this? Like, I know, I, I know this, but I'm not arguing with Bob Saget. Um, <laughs> right. So there, like, there's, there's moments like that, and you're like, oh man, that's a horrible interview. And then when you go back, you're like, no, that's great piece of like something to promote, something to add, like put out there. And then if someone's like, oh my god, I can't believe he shared that, I'm like, of course I shared it. It's to anyone that's probably like in the industry or uh, wanting to be a broadcaster. It's almost like you, even your best of best mess up. Like James Duffy on TSN the other night was like. I'm Jimmy Studio. And he was like, Jimmy Studio is having a bad night. And I'm like, what is he doing? But he's almost just like, I made a mistake. I'm going to curve into the mistake. You're all going to laugh. We're all going to have fun at it. And I'm like, pro. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's a, that's a performer's mentality too, right? You, I, I can only speak to my experience, but yeah. I haven't grown up with the kind of training that I did. It was dance training and it was theater training. And then the huge huge training camp of YTV, you can call it. I had, like, every day there's something. Every day there's something that's gonna go wrong, gonna go a little bit left, and you just gotta make the best of it. It's, it things will rarely go perfectly or exactly the way that you um, planned it or, or wanted it to go. So though, if you hold on too tight to an idea of something, even when you're yeah. going into an interview, um, you might lose the opportunity for something better to come out that you didn't expect, right? So you got to yeah. kind of roll with things. Now, of course, we're in like we're in COVID. Now we're all in different layers layers of COVID. I feel in Newfoundland we're a little bit more relaxed. Um, but like, tell me, how have you been dealing with? I guess COVID. Like, of course, you have I believe two children as well. Yeah, yeah. And like, how, how are you handling all this in COVID? Because I know in Ontario, it's almost like okay, you can't you can't do this, but you can do this. You can't do that, but you can do this. It's almost like, how is your mindset? <laughs> yeah, it's it's weird to, for a while trying to keep up with what you could and couldn't do was sort of like a, a futile exercise because things would change. Um, my wife and I kind of decided, okay, if we're in lockdown, it just means we're in lockdown. So mm -hmm. we're gonna just, we're gonna hunker down more than pretty much anybody else that, that we know. And maybe that's not even true, but maybe a lot of people yeah. took this attitude as well. But we just thought, we're just gonna be here in this house. We like spending time together. The kids like being here. So we're just gonna make the best out of what we've got right here and not trying to think about all the things that we're missing. Because yeah. if we can stick tight to what we're doing, we're gonna get back to those things hopefully sooner than later. And it'll depend on everybody, of course, but 
we have to be able to be okay with where we are now. Because if we're constantly thinking about the things that we can't do, we're not going to be able to be happy. I mean, we're not going to be satisfied. So, you know, the kids have been in virtual school since spring of last year, and that's what they're accustomed to. And like, um, my daughter would like to go back to a regular school. My son could probably do this forever. Like he digs, he, he digs it. Like he's in his, his room, it's like his own office. He gets to, he had, almost has his own hours. Like it's wild. Yeah. He can go on recess. He gets to come out and grab grab his own snack for recess, go out in the backyard, play for a bit, and then go back to class. Like, I don't know. It's just, that's the way that we've been looking at it. It's just trying to be, take what we've got and make the best out of everything that we've got right now. And then when we can open up to other things, we'll do that too. But if we try to, if we try to rush it or be too, like, hold on too much to the idea of what life was like two years ago, it's yeah. going to be much, much harder. Yeah. That's when you start like your, uh, your own TikTok tap dance. Like you have your own That's school it. of tap dancing. Right? Your TikTok school of tap dancing. TikTok. Yeah, there you go. Like, you, you heard <laughs> there's something you heard, there. Yeah, yeah. You hear Disney plus with the high school musical, the musical. That's like, you know, That's now right. you have, you know, Carlos tap dance, like, you don't know, COVID tap dance. It's like, you know, the thing, offer that you think Disney. <laughs> <laughs> get, get involved. Uh, mm. Carlos, I, I want to like kind of wrap it up close to because i like to try to keep it like close to an hour it might go a mm -hmm. little bit over just because to edit sure. it um but another thing i'd really like to ask you about is like in covid you now you mentioned of course one of your uh one of your kids loves doing the online learning one of them wants to mm -hmm. go back to school like how is you have have a thought like as a father like, how do you kind of adapt to kind of explain them about COVID? Do you, do you find them getting a little bit like, I guess, depressed or sad? Cause I mean, I have a niece and nephew that one really does love, you know, online learning. Cause he's like, great, same way I get to do this, get my own hours. And the other one really yeah. misses the interaction with their friends. And even down here when they have like, they're open up to say brownies or girl scouts, but it's a little, still a little bit different. So I don't know, like for me and maybe yourself, you're kind of used to it. Like as you got the adult mentality of, hey, like we'll get through it. But to a kid, this is like brand new to them also, but maybe they don't get it as much or they're not. They're like, oh, why can't I see my friend? Why can't I do this? Yeah. I mean, there's a few things in that. Our daughter is eight. And so over a full year of her life has been COVID lockdown, right? Our yeah. son is 10. So same. Um, it's not like before COVID lockdown, they were living my lifestyle, which yeah. is flying around a lot, going to parties, doing all these things that you do that's part of work, right? They were in school, seeing their friends, seeing their cousins, and being at home. Um, the hardest thing for them is not being able to see family, like be in the same room with family, give their grandma a hug, give their give my mother, give her a hug. Yeah. Um, those things are difficult for them but they're ongoing conversations and we've we've talked a lot with them about what the sort of what the boundaries are that we've set up for our household and we've also explained like not every household is doing it the exact same way like you might see some friends out in the street doing it a different way than we're doing it but this is how this is how we believe we've got to do it the best way for all of us um and there's great consequence on the other end of that i think for us if we don't um, if we hadn't been doing it this way for a long time. And so I want to say that we're pretty lucky with these two in that we haven't had, there's been no fights about it. There've been no arguments about it. There've been a lot of questions and there've yeah. been tears and some sadness, but a lot of that is them being sad for everybody. Like it's them yeah. being sad. Like they'll think about their friend yeah. and how their friend can't see their grandma, that sort of thing. Okay. They're sad for themselves too. But like I said, we just have been trying our best to make this environment for them um, a healthy one, a fun one. And one of the bonuses for me is that, again, like my lifestyle before this was not being here. Yeah. Right? And so what's new for us is us actually getting to spend every day together. Because we, my time with them before this was like evenings and some weekends. Yeah. And and a lot of the time I'd be gone for weekends at a time, two weeks at a time, a month at a time. Right. So for us to be here, I think there's it's funny to say that there's a there was a bit of a novelty in that, like dad's around. Yeah. Um, but also we've 
I don't know. We just have been enjoying our time together. I think that's the. I don't have any sort of answers, but that's the way that we. No, been, no. I, know, I, I like it. to think. I, I like to think mm -hmm. of it as like not to like make fun of it because I, I know COVID is a, a big deal, but I like to think of it as like the perfect dog life. If you're like a stay at home dog, and like when your parents, like when, like when your parents leave in the morning, for you're sure. like great. It's like you guys are all leaving me today. Now I got to stay here for like six and seven hours and kind of hold in my piss, and then like yeah, now dogs, it's almost like. The dogs parents are always here. <laughs> dogs love it. Cats hate it. That's what it is, man. Dogs are like, cats I can't like, believe you're home all day. And then the yeah. cat is like, you're home all day. hundred <laughs> percent. That's exactly yeah. it. And uh, I don't know. We're dog people. Yeah. That's all yeah. I can say to that. I feel like, I yeah. feel like in, in contrast, it's like dogs are like your infants when it's like a toddler. A toddler doesn't want you to leave. They love it. Where like a cat is like a teenage child where it's like, oh. I got to be seen with you in public. It's like, relax, well, calm that's down. Probably, that's probably one of the things that's, that's so, that's so lucky for us in all this, you know, obviously it's, everyone has <clears throat> um, their own mountains to climb with this thing. It's a very difficult yeah. thing to go through for everybody. But for us, like our kids are not teenagers, yeah. right? Our kids are, our kids are still kind of, they're, they're pretty little. Like my, I, every Saturday and Sunday, my kids are like, yo, can we play some Nintendo? And I'm like, yes, we can. Like, that's yeah. what we're doing. It's great. I'm here. Let's play Nintendo. Like, that's how we're sort of approaching it. I mean, not to say that if they were 13, I'd still be like, yo, let's play some Nintendo. But, um, <laughs> They'd probably be like, no, what, you're my dad. God, stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Do they ever see you, I guess, on TV? Like, I know they're still young, but do you ever worry or like, I guess not worry, but do you ever think that they're going to go back into the vault on like YouTube and see old clips of you and like either taunt you or be like, Oh my God, that's really cool. Dad. Or do you think they're going to be like, I can't believe you did that dad. God. <laughs> I think I'm prepared for it. Having, having done it for as long as I did and having like the, um, having Twitter for as long as I've had or, or meeting kids in person that were maybe to put it kind of like not appreciative of YTV. Like I've yeah. had a lot of, a lot of kids say a lot of, <laughs> a lot of awful things to me. So yeah. I don't know, maybe hearing it from my own kids would hurt a bit more, but I think I feel like I'm prepared. I feel like I'm yeah. prepared for it. I, I like how you brought up Twitter because I want to ask you this because a lot of people use their Twitter handle of like their first name, last name, or a combination. Like mm -hmm. what is with your Twitter handle? What is what is that? Well, which I've I have the Carlos B, which is the one I use on Twitter. Yeah. And on Instagram, it's yeah, and that's like my the more professional one, I guess. Yeah. Los Bot is the other one that I use. Yeah, like what, what? What's with that one? What? Why the name? It's literally it's just a holdover from an in joke with a friend. Oh really? Stuck. Okay. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, we're, we're keeping that. That's what works. And we've talked about changing it here and there, but enough people have been like, well, yeah, I mean, it works, and you've been using it for so long, so whatever. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Let's just keep it. Yeah. Do you find, I, I guess, to kind of bring it full spectrum here, because uh, I, I like talking 90s, early 2000s, and of course, I, I want to, because when we get people like yourself on that been in the media, um, during, I guess, like what I call like the peak of uh, children's entertainment, in a way, it's like, do you find now with social media, when people like kind of reach out to you, because we, we kind of discussed it earlier, it's like the only time back in the day for someone to contact you would be like, you know, either see in person or send mail to YTV and hope it gets in your hand and then wait. Yeah. Right. But yeah. Just find it now weird. Like when old, like my like crowd, like myself or younger crowd come up to you and say, I seen you on this, or I like you on this, or they're brave. Or I shouldn't say maybe not as brave, but tweet you and be like, I can't, I hated you on YTV, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Do you like get all this? And you're like, man, how do you, how do you handle all that? The best one I ever got was, I think it was on Twitter. And I was still on YTV and someone someone had been like, oh, Carlos is on YTV. Or we're watching big fun movies. Oh, great. We're going to watch Space Jam or something like some movie that we would show on big fun movies. Yes. And like the quality of those movies ranges, right? Like some of them yeah. are great. And some of them are whatever, not so great. Some are Cadet and, Kelly. Some are like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it was, it was in a conversation to his friends. And one of his friends had had like, made a joke about how he was, how he'd put me in the comment or he'd, he'd added me in the, in his comment. And, um, and so I basically I, I replied to them because at, he was kind of like, he was negative, yeah. right? Like he was being yeah, negative yeah. about what he was saying about me and me being at YT. Yeah, and, yeah. and when I replied to it, I was like, well, I think it's funny that a grown man is sitting there watching space ships. And he 
whoa, whoa, yo, Carlos, whoa, I can't believe you guys should fight. Blah, blah. And the conversation spun yeah. from that into, because they were in Calgary. And so there, yeah. it ended on, if ever you're in Calgary, come by and yeah. we'll hang out. And I was like, 100%. Like, if, if, if I'm ever in Calgary, we will watch Space Chimps together. <laughs> and I'll bring I'll bring the Doritos and let's hang out and watch this movie together. And that's what we ended on. And then I hope I'm remembering this right because I feel like I have this memory. But Tiff, a few years later, um, I met a couple of those guys because they were in line for a movie. Oh wow! And they had been like, "Hey, Carlos, we we were the guys that added you about whatever Space Chimps." And I was like, "Oh, well, like I mean, it's nice to finally meet you guys. We still have to watch a movie together, but maybe we'll watch one a tip or whatever." Mm -hmm. yeah. It ended up happening, but it was one of those moments where, and it's not really rare where someone really reaches out because they, I don't know, that they, they they're clever, they're clever, yeah. and they think of themselves as clever, and they think of themselves as funny, and they might not think of you yeah. as a human being. You're a uh, some you're a target or whatever it is you yeah. are. And when you get a chance to actually just like meet that person, then like everything's kind of cool. Yeah. That's, and that's happened a bunch of times. And that's great. I, you well, know, that's, it's it's funny because like in fairness with Twitter, like I'll I'll be openly admit about it too, where it's like sometimes I'll tweet something at a person and sometimes I'll at them as if to be like, you know, being either negative towards it, and then sometimes you're positive. And I I just find it's like weird because we're in a world where it's like the positive ones and it could just be me, my interaction of it, but like the positive ones, it's like they like it or they might just say cool, but like the negative ones really get them triggered or it's like they'll respond to the negative more than the positive. And I'm like, okay, like I remember maybe my example would be lights, like the artist lights out, out West. And I kept on sending her just like messages of like, love this song, love like that you're doing Instagram live, love the smash mouth cover, blah, 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 nothing. And then someone had retweeted or like another musician and she instantly was like, oh, I'm so glad you liked it. And then I was like, okay, I get it. They have like this blue check mark. So I like sent her a message and I was like, so what? I'm not important. I don't have a blue check mark. And then she's like, I've never said that. I was like, oh shit, I pissed off lights. I was like, I sent her like 20 nice messages. <laughs> I sent her one more or less being mad. And that's the one she responds to. I was like, oh great. Lights is mad at me. But um, yeah, like, do you find that with social media? Because I guess you get both the, the good and the bad, like you said, but do you get, and I hope it's not, to uh i don't want to get too personal with it but of course you know everyone is talking somewhat about say racism uh sometimes you get like these tweets or messages where it's like it's out of line obviously but like do you get those and how do you respond to those ones um if someone's targeting me in that way uh i you know when it comes to people being negative towards you, but actually like with that intent, not, not the intent yeah. of necessarily like making a mistake or just wanting to get your attention or whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't like to wade into it. I don't like to wade into negativity. If, if there's a constructive conversation that can be had about something, yeah. then like, then we'll talk about it. Um, but like I said to you, more often than not, when I do reply to something, um, we'll talk it through and it ends up, oh, were actually just really cool. I have had quite a few, yeah. um, I don't know, recently where I've just sort of seen someone might at me in a comment where they're actually being offensive. Like where they're yeah. actually being like, I hate this yeah. type of people. Yeah. And like, I'm, I happen to be that type of person or whatever. Um, but it's like, you don't want to give that thing oxygen. You don't want to, yeah. you don't want to feed that fire and give it oxygen. Um, we can talk, sometimes you can talk to people and it just and it doesn't get through you know sometimes you can have trying to have conversation with someone about points of view and why some things might be important to look at again and they're maybe not ready at the time so if it's if it's writing on the bathroom wall and it's meant to be negative for the sake of being negative yeah. um i'm i'm i think i'm a bit different maybe in your experience because if if someone's commenting something positive I do try to respond to that. Like I like to yeah. feed that a little bit more than the other one. Uh, so Carlos, our last question, the biggest question ever on this podcast. Uh, you've done a lot of things in your career. If sure. you had to do one thing again, it would be, would you rather dangle from the CN Tower? Yeah. Would you rather bobsled down the Olympic track? Mm -hmm. uh, hop in a cage with a 700 pound tiger or do mm -hmm. another interview with Tobin tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, the last two are basically the same. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, ruthless. Yeah. 
and this and this has been very similar to the thrill of going down a, a what do you call it bobsled in in Calgary. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's a tie between those two, between uh, Tobin tonight and and bobsledding in Calgary. If we could if somehow combine them, I mean, the real thing what we got to figure out here is how do we do an interview while going down an actual bobsled track? Challenge that's, accepted. That's a question. That's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Carlos for coming on to the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob saying, thank you for listening, and good night.